about uh, the first Sunday of March, and I said at that time that uh, we're doing communion quite yet. That's usually the week we do communion. I said we're going to put it off because we are almost at the part of Mark where we get the communion story. And so now we come to the end of the month, and that's exactly where we are. But we're going to do it a little bit different today. We're actually going to do communion twice this week. If you're here on Good Friday, we're going to do it again. And on Good Friday, we're going to look at the second part of the passage that we're going to look at today. We're actually going to make this a little bit of a different sermon, and then we're going to do it in two parts. Ah, that gets hard, because I know, well, we're missing people today, and it's very possible we're going to be missing people on Good Friday, but take it in as advertisement. Friday's important. We're going to do a 10 a.m. Friday. It's going to be a slightly different time than that. 10 a.m. We're going to finish off this sermon then. Because we come to a great holiday meal. Maybe not the meal you're quite expecting that I'm going to talk about, but I actually talk about a Jewish meal. Passover. Passover was the highlight of the year among the Jewish people. It is where the justice of God is brought down onto earth. The justice of God is brought to people. A nation is kept as slaves, and they are given their freedom by God himself. And freedom reigns as God breaks into our world in a supernatural way. But within that, there's punishment. Every home in the nation of Egypt is to see death visited upon it. Every home is going to know justice from God. And freedom will be bought at a great, harsh price. It did not matter the background of the people. There is only one hope, and that is that the people slay a lamb and put its blood around the door as a sign of faith and a sign that death has already come to this home, that the price is being paid. Read one author this week who said, When justice came, they had the opportunity to shelter under a substitute, to shelter under the blood of the Lamb. If you did, not, if you did accept this shelter, then death passed over you and you were saved. And that is why it is called Passover. You were saved only on the basis of faith in a substitutionary sacrifice. In other words, this lamb would die and your family is spared. The price had to be paid for this fight for justice and freedom. However, symbolically, you could give your punishment to another. This kind of hard start to the day, isn't it? That's kind of how it is on Holy Week, though. We kind of have to focus a little bit on death and punishment. And you know what? I'm going to tell you, it's going to lead to great joy. Because death is not the final statement in all of this. Jesus is. The Jewish people, from the moment they are rescued from the land of Egypt, taken out of slavery, given freedom, from then on, every year, God says, I want you to relive this ceremony. I want you to relive this. I don't want you to forget it. I don't want you even just to do some sort of commemoration of it. I don't want it to be something kind of that every once in a while you think you should talk about. I want you to relive this. The Lamb is to die every year. You are to go through this ceremony. It is to bring you right back to the moment where I brought the people out of Israel and great traditions rise around the Passover meal that they relive year to year. 
And the Passover became a meal like no other in their year. Every spring, the head of the household would lead all the guests in the house in a meal to remind them of the price that is paid to overcome oppression, to overcome injustice, Christ we might live. And what difference does a lamb make? I mean, they're woolly, they're cute, they're delicious. Why would killing them bring us peace? I mean, really? After more than a thousand years of tradition, Jesus would sit down with his disciples in a very familiar setting. And he would lead his disciples into some deeper truths about it. And how, how they would all look forward to that meal. Do you have the traditional meals in your family to look forward to? Story of a young boy named Ernie who was went with his family to Grandma's for Easter dinner. And uh, they were looking forward to it, of course. And uh, all the traditional meal was brought out immediately. He started digging in and eating them away, and his parents said, hang on just a second. You, you know we always say grace before the meal. Why, why, did, why aren't you waiting? And he said, I don't have to. Well, of course you do, Ernie. We always say a prayer before eating. He said, well, that's in our house. But this is Grandma's, and she knows how to cook. <laughs> Traditions may be broken in our modern world a lot more, but in the Jewish Passover tradition, they didn't break the traditions of how they ate. They prepared it the same all the time. They knew what to expect, but it wasn't just the meal. It was all that went into it. It was all the preparations. It was all the words that were spoken, the prayers that were said. Jesus leads his disciples into a tradition. But he leads them into a much deeper understanding. And in the church, we traditionally do part of the meal. We get a little bread and we get a little kind of wine. It's not really wine. We have grape juice here. But, but we have the, these little parts of the meal. We don't do it all. But, but there's power sometimes to reliving. Not just talking about tradition, but actually recreating. To understand, we need to back up in the passage a little bit. We're going to talk about the preparation. We're going to look at the first little bit of this passage real quickly. Jesus says, okay, I want you to go into Jerusalem, and that's where we're going to have the meal. They're staying in Bethany, just on the outskirts of the city. They probably could have Passover on where they're staying. It's Jerusalem. It has to be Jerusalem. It has to be the holy city. I want you to go, and I want you to find a man carrying a jug of water, which would have been very unusual. The women carried the water. The men never did. I mean, this guy would have stuck out. They're probably looking, sure, we're going to find him. This is kind of like, we'll find the man with the big beard wearing a dress. That's kind of the equivalent. Go find this guy. I want you to follow him. And when he gets to his house, talk to the guy who owns the house. Say that Jesus wants to use this, and he's going to take you upstairs. It's going to be a special house. Not, probably most of the places where the disciples say they didn't have two stories, but there's an extra room on top. It would have been a guest room. That's where you're going to go. You are going to prepare the meal according to the traditions that go back a thousand years. Go there. And as they're doing it, they're starting in the city to get the lambs ready for Passover. It took some time. You couldn't just go at that time down to the local store and pick up some lamb chops. Not how it worked. You had to get a lamb, whole lamb, live lamb, spotless, perfect lamb. It had to be killed in a very specific way that the bones were not broken and that it was bled completely. It couldn't just be bled at the local butcher shop either. You took it to the temple, the priest did. The 
blood was then placed on the altar to God. Why? Well, they don't understand yet. We will. The only thing that's kind of odd about all this, they're doing this a tad early. Usually, um, the, the, they, they should be doing it the next day. They're doing it a day early. They're going to have on Thursday night their Passover meal. Very deliberate. Everything that's going on here, Jesus is putting great preparation into the work because everything is leading to this event. Everything is leading, specifically, to this Passover. Not just the meal, but the whole event that goes with it. They get to the meal. Mark very quickly comes partway into the meal and says, Jesus knows something that's coming. We were hinted at last week, if you were with us, that Judas had decided that he was so disgusted with everything that's going on, that he's going to sell Jesus out to the, to the religious leaders. They're planning on arresting him quietly after the Passover is all done. He sneaks up to him and says, no, I can deliver him to you before then. We, we can get him. And they offer him some money to get him early. It's a betrayal, except with a big exception. Usually betrayals are surprises. This one is not a surprise. Oh, it's hard. Who's the villain in this story? I mean, we know this story, right? I mean, immediately, of course, jumps to mind Judas, the betrayer. One of the twelve, one of those who was closest to Jesus, he betrays Jesus. He's not the only one. We don't quite come to it in this part of Mark, but we start to discover it in this meal that, that one of the other twelve is going to deny him. And we're certainly going to come to that a, a few passages later in Mark, that Peter, the closest disciple to Jesus, he is three times going to deny knowing Jesus. Do you know he's a villain in this story? He's not the only one. The other ten of the disciples, Jesus says, you're all going to run away. At the moment where I'm going to need you the most, you are going to run away. You're going to run away. Do you know what? Those who love Jesus the best end up being the villains of this story. The reason for the cross is not Jesus' enemies, it is his followers. Those who say they love Jesus are actually the ones who put him on the cross. I'm no better, I'm the villain in this story too. No better than any of the other ones because it's my sin to put him there. It is my sin that nailed him to the cross. And Judas is taking his bread and as part of the traditional part of the meal, we're going to come to it in a minute, he places bread into some bitter herbs and he pulls it out and he does it with Jesus. And, and this part of the meal they, they're eating bitter herbs because it reminds them of the bitterness of slavery. It reminds them of the bitterness of where they've come from. And in a shocking moment, Judas, and Mark doesn't make this quite as clear as the other Gospels do, but at this moment, Judas accepts the bitterness and he leaves. Do you know what? He misses the end of Passover. Because we're not going to be left with bitterness. That's not where the story ends. But it's where Judas leaves. We can all experience the bitterness. 
We can all experience the brokenness that comes at this moment. But Jesus, I think, very deliberately dismisses Judas here. Because he leaves at this moment of bitterness and he's going to miss the hope and grace that are going to come at the end of the meal. <sighs> Woe to this one. He stands condemned. The rest of the disciples, Peter and the rest, are also the villains in the story, but with one big difference. And I hope it's a difference we can all relate to. I hope everybody here can relate to the big difference. Judas left because he had hoped that he could become the new elite of Israel. He looked around, he saw the, the religious leaders, he saw the political leaders. He wanted a taste of it. He wanted it so bad that's what he wanted to do. He wanted to replace those who were in power. And Jesus did not want a new set of religious leaders because the old ones were corrupt. Jesus came to change hearts. He came to change lives. Judas was jealous of those on earth and what he, they had, what he wanted. The rest of the disciples, they, they're going to get something different. They're going to get something very different. They're going to get the cup of Jesus. So we come to the meal itself. I mean, I'm not going to walk through the. At one point, I kind of thought, what I was going to do this week was walk through the meal. We did this about a year ago. Some of you may have been with us. Uh, we had a, a missionary from Jews for Jesus with us. It was the second time we'd done this over the last few years, where he actually portrayed the whole Passover meal for us and, and explained all the symbolism behind it. There is credible symbolism behind it. And I, I would love to do it again because it's very powerful. But I also want to lead us in a little bit of a different direction. But the meal itself was remarkable. The head of the feast would, would take the first cup, and we're going to talk about the meaning behind the four cups of Passover on Friday. Again, this is really bad advertising on my part, but Friday at 10 o'clock. Don't forget. Good Friday service. We're going to talk about the four cups. Everybody would take the first cup, he would bless it, then he would go and he would symbolically wash his hands. But Jesus did something that no head of a Passover would ever do. He not only went and symbolically washed his hands, he got down and washed the feet of his disciples. That's where that occurs. And then they would eat bitter herbs and salt water, the salt water being for tears, the bitter herbs being for the bitterness of slavery. They would clear it away, they'd pour some more wines, they would eat the bread dipped in the bitter herbs, which is where Judas leaves and misses the rest. Then they would take away the bitterness and they would bring out a lamb. A spotless lamb, carefully prepared. Bled with the blood thrown over the altar. The perfect lamb who provided shelter when they needed salvation. Interesting, the, none of the gospel accounts talk about the lamb. I mean, that certainly was the centerpiece of the meal. Can you imagine talking about Christmas dinner without mentioning the turkey? It's kind of the same thing. Why do none of the Gospels mention the lamb that was certainly there? Because they're providing focus that Jesus was the lamb. Then Jesus does something startling. He takes the bread. Now, we tend to use soda cream. Communion. Well, we, this is actually quite intentional. Now, part of the reason is because getting good matzo bread is hard in Viking, but um, Viking Foods usually doesn't have it, and they usually do have soda crackers. <laughs> and we don't want to keep these things too long. We learned that lesson the hard way a few communions ago, a few years ago. You were here, and we took the bread. Does anybody remember that? The year we took the bread and discovered these things actually go rotten? Anyways. This is close, though. I mean, it, I, I don't know if it's completely yeastless, but you couldn't have yeast because they had to flee quickly. 
Their salvation came upon them quickly, just like the salvation of Jesus comes upon them quickly, that all of a sudden he's on the cross. But also that yeast came to symbolize sin. No sin in this bread. But it's got little holes in it. I don't know if you can see that. I can see you through the holes. It's pierced. Isaiah talks about our Savior being pierced for our transgressions. And the way it's cooked, this doesn't do it great. But, but you can see little stripes on it, kind of like the whip marks on the back of Jesus. It's actually not bad for the symbolism. It gets us close. And Jesus, he took it. They were supposed to bless it and eat it. Instead, Jesus breaks it. And he shows them, you know what? This is me. This is me. This is me. And it's not just a broken, it's like he's destroyed. His body is shattered. And he said, this is my body. Broken. Why is it broken? my body broken for you. I fit in there you. This is, this is what happens to me. I've got a little bit of a bigger piece left. This is what happens to me. Broken for you. And they took the cup again and again. I'm going to talk about the cups on Good Friday. But then he provides new meaning to the third and fourth cup that they bring. And we just drink from one cup in our communion because two of the Gospels just talk about one cup. Luke mentions that there's more than one cup. Jesus already proclaimed earlier, I am the bread of life. That which was a memorial of something long ago was given new meaning. There's been tons of preparation that's gone into this meal. And the meal itself points towards Jesus. It's being prepared, Jesus being prepared for more than a millennium. God's been getting this ready for over a thousand years to point to this one Passover. Passover and communion are memorial meals. They are very different than commemorations. It is an invitation to actually join in the event. This isn't something we just passively watch. This is something we participate in to relive it. Last week, I asked the question, is Jesus worth it? You know what my question this week is? Do you need Jesus? If we are the villains in this story, do we need the cross of Christ. I'm going to tell you, as a church, we need to over and over and over again come to the cross. If we don't keep coming to the cross, we are lost in it. Judas took the bread and he dipped it in the bitter herbs and ate it and then left. We are going to be like Judas today, in a sense. But we're going to make one big difference. We are going to do communion very different today. I've, I've done this before, once, and I found it quite powerful, but I've never led the church in it, and I don't know if I'll ever do it again. So if you don't like it, you may never have to do this again, so bear with me for a minute. We've got our little Ritz, or not Ritz crackers, our soda crackers, broken into little pieces. We've done that in advance. Harvey and I are going to come around, He's going to have, have the little pieces of cracker, but we're going to do something very different with the cup. Judas dipped into the bowl and it was bitterness. We're going to dip our cracker into the cup. Symbolic of us taking up the blood of Jesus. And usually I have everybody wait until everybody's got, we're, we're, just, we're going to do this individually because otherwise you'll have really sloppy. We're actually following me. Just 
dip your cracker in there. Now, obviously, just my wife pointed out one health thing: don't don't finger it, and then you know, you know, just just take the corner of it. And, yeah, we'll try to do this somewhat healthy, and then I'll I'll switch out the cups halfway through. But as we're doing this, consider what communion is. Consider the body that's been broken for you. And um, after we've uh, passed out the communion elements, uh, we'll come to